E658 lecture 7. So, yesterday we were talking about charge injection and mass switches where the basic idea is the following. When the switch is on, say let us say this was VDD and this was some VN and as we said yesterday, we uh, assume that the VN is not so large so as to put the transistor off. Okay? So, VN is less than VDD minus VT and when the switch is on, the very fact that the switch has to conduct means that there has to be channel charge. And so, that basically means that there is uh, some channel st charge st stuck there. When you turn the switch off, this channel charge has to get out of the channel. right? There are only two places it can go. It can go either to the left or to the right, corresponding to either the source or the drain terminals. So, at this point, we do not know enough except the following that the channel charge is a nonlinear function of, of V in to first order. We said it is approximately C ox times WL times V G S which is V D D minus V N minus V T. Clearly you know that V T depends on V N through some nonlinear relationship, right? That should be convincing enough to prove that the channel charge is nonlinear function of V. And not only that, we also know that when you turn the switch off, so you have the whole capacitor here, when you turn the switch off, some as yet unknown fraction of the channel charge gets dumped on the on C. So, this is clearly a problematic situation and uh, for a long time people were trying to figure out uh, what to do about this simply because every time you, you, you do a sampling operation you end up with distortion and especially when you have designed your uh, sample and hold to have a large tracking bandwidth. What does that mean? If you want to have a large tracking bandwidth, what, what does it mean? You want to make the resistance of the switch very, very small, which means that if you want to make the resistance of the switch small, what can you say about the channel charge? Is large. So, if you want to make high speed sample and holds, this is like you know a terrible problem because the switch is big because you want to make uh, the tracking bandwidth high. The moment the switch is big, you have a large amount of charge some unknown fraction of that which, uh, which uh, gets dumped on to the whole capacitor the moment you turn the switch off. So, at a pinch it would have been ok if the channel charge was some, some quantity which was independent of V in and this unknown fraction also remained independent of V in. See right now we do not know an unknown fraction. And this unknown fraction could depend on the input as yet, as yet we do not know. It turns out that it does. So, at a pinch things could have been a lot better if this channel charge was either independent of Vn and some fixed fraction of this charge got dumped onto the capacitor that would be a happy situation. Why? It just looks like an offset and you know that offset is not really that big of a problem because once you quantize the output, you have everything in digital form. So, it is quite straightforward to go and correct this offset digitally. Conceivably, one could simply average out the uh, signal in the digital domain and once you average the signal out in the digital domain, you what left with is the offset, you can go and digitally correct it off without even trying to fool around with anything in the analog. So, offset is a benign thing. So, now the question is, uh, so what do you do about this? So, any ideas? Let me also ask you another question. All right. So, we said an unknown fraction of this charge, some part of it moves to the left, some part of it moves to the right. One thing we can say for absolutely sure is the fact that if one side of the, of the uh, switch was, was an open circuit, no capacitor, nothing. So, this was an open circuit, this was VDD, this was some VN, there was some charge in the channel. When you turn the switch off, where do you think the channel charge must go? This channel charge, when this end is an open circuit, this channel charge cannot go into the open circuit, it must go to the left. So, one observation is the following that is when one side of this, uh, the switch is open, all charge gets injected into the input. And this does not have to do with details of device physics or Fermi level or anything. This is like pretty straightforward to see. 
So then somebody came along and said, hey, if this is if this is true, then you can make a sample and hold where the signal dependent charge injection is not an issue. So anybody wants to give it a try? So you have the switch, you have the sample and hold. So the idea is to put another switch in the bottom plate of the capacitor. If both these switches opened and closed at the same time, it would be absolutely indistinguishable, I mean performance wise. So let me call this switch A and this call this switch B. So if I call this phi and this is C and this is phi, if both these switches were controlled by this clock phi, when phi is high, the switch is closed, when phi is low, the switch is open, there is seemingly no difference between what we had earlier and what we have now. Can you comment on the charge in, so uh, to make matters a little more clear, I will replace this by a MOS transistor like we had before and this also by a MOS transistor. So this is phi, this is phi. So, so can you comment on the, uh, on the, uh, we have already seen that the charge in switch A is proportional, is dependent on the input. Can you comment on the charge in switch B? The charge in switch B is proportional to VGS minus VT. The VGS of, of this switch is simply is VDD, right? C ox times W times L times VDD. So the charge in switch A is signal dependent, whereas the charge in switch B is signal independent. So when you turn so now can somebody tell me what you can do? When are you sampling? When is the sampling instant defined? When phi falls down, that is the falling edge of phi. So the, the clever idea is to switch this switch off just before you switch A off. So what happens is so that basically means that instead of clocking this with phi, you clock this with phi sub a, where phi sub a is an advanced version of phi in this manner. I am just grossly exaggerating the edges for clarity here. This is phi and this for example could be the waveform shown in red is phi advanced and the waveform shown in black is phi and basically there is some small delay delta t between the two of them. Hmm? Where the idea is to make sure that switch B has turned off before A turns off. So what do you think happens to the charge in switch B? Well, the ch as yet, see please note that one thing is that the charge in switch B is independent of the input signal. When you turn switch B off, some unknown fraction of that charge goes and gets dumped onto, onto the capacitor. Okay? But please note that the potential of both the ends of the switch are, are the same when it was on. Correct? So you can expect that the, the amount, this random fraction which we do not know of as yet will still be independent of V in because none of the terminals, uh, switch terminal voltages depend on V in. Does it make sense? Alright. The, the observe, key observation is that the ter, all the terminals of this switch B are at potentials which do not depend on the input in any manner. So even though there was some random unknown fraction of this channel charge getting dumped on either side we can expect that that fraction remains constant irrespective of the of Vn. Now the key is to open switch B before opening A in which case how does it look? So in the beginning both were on so you have uh, this is the equivalent circuit so both on then what you go into a situation where switch B is off, so this is floating. The bottom plate of the capacitor is 
floating all right and the charge in switch a still is signal dependent it is c ox times w by l times vgs minus vt vgs is vdd minus vn so this is b is off a is on and then now you open switch a what happens all the charge will go into please note that this side is an open circuit as far as the switch is concerned because there is a capacitor but there is no path after that uh, when you uh, when you open switch a all this charge is nowhere to go except to the left both are off and all this charge has gone this way all right so the voltage across this capacitor c is comprised of what all components it's comprised of the input it is comprised of or the charge on that capacitor depends on what all, is now comprised of what all it is dependent definitely on the input it has got a small component hopefully of a fraction of the charge in the in the switch b and it's got some charge due to thermal i mean due to thermal noise and the mean square <coughs> voltage across the capacitor due to thermal noise is simply kt by I mean, we have two switches here. How come the noise is still KT by C? Uh, it's only due to. Okay, so but uh, can you comment on the? What he's saying is that the uh, the sampling instant is determined by when is the sampling instant? So you look at this this waveform for the two clocks which control the switches, and can you tell me when is the sampling instant? The sampling instant is the instant at which phi A falls. That I mean that uh, is the instant at which the bottom switch opens. So the sampling switch, sampling instant is when phi a falls. All right. So uh, some comment was made saying that the noise uh, on the capacitor corresponds to only that produced by switch B. Is that true or? Then answer my question. The question is: uh, Is the noise coming only because of resistor A, or is it coming because of resistor A and B? It is coming because of both. Is that clear? I mean, you can think of it. Uh, for those of you who are a little puzzled by noise, still, you can think of it as there is one noise source here, there is another noise source here, and when you open switch B, you will basically capture V n plus V n one. Plus V N two, so the noise pro, uh, is coming from both resistors, and as he pointed out, it's equivalent to having a, a, a twice the resistance in series to the capacitance. And uh, as we discussed yesterday, even if the resistance was, twi uh, was twice, we saw that the integrated noise remains the same because the bandwidth of the RC filter falls down. So this is a key circuit technique that's used all the time, and this is called bottom plate sampling and it's a very very powerful idea. So now, uh, does it really work, or is there some something that we have not taken into account? It turns out that some parasitic capacitance there, so that when this is floating, I mean it's not truly floating. There is going to be a small parasitic capacitance from that node to ground. I mean, on a circuit without knowing anything, you can say that every node has got a parasitic capacitance to ground. You can only hope that this capacitance would be extremely small, and in practice, it's fairly straightforward to do so. Parasitic capacitance here. If this is a huge parasitic capacitance, that's obviously a problem. But in practice, it turns out that you can make that parasitic capacitance extremely small compared to this capacitance C. So this charge injection is uh, signal dependent charge injection is mitigated to a large extent. Is that clear? So you can see how this. I mean, this is a pretty straightforward, simple idea, right? And you can see how it. I mean, in the early 70s, uh, in late 70s, people were struggling with this charge injection phenomenon. So a lot of papers written about modeling exactly how much charge goes in where and depends on the input and all this other stuff. But you can see that without knowing anything, there is a simple circuit idea which basically gets rid of, of the problem. And this is a key enabler for a whole family of analog circuits called switch capacitor circuits where the basic idea is to sample the input on a, sphere, uh, on a capacitor and then manipulate this charge in various ways. And if you cannot sample the analog signal with reasonable amount of precision, then you know having very precise processing later on hardly makes any sense that covers charge injection what you can do a practical way of mitigating uh, errors due to charge injection and now as we just discussed uh, 
this bottom plate sampling causes offset which is which is benign because it can be gotten rid of later in many applications offset does not matter at all and in uh, applications where it does they, you mean you can actually get rid of it. Okay. So, so far we have seen the following that is whatever switch we built, we built three switches the NMOS switch, the PMOS switch and the the, uh, the transmission gate. So, all the three of them have you know the same same disease namely I mean uh, they all add noise sure and the uh, the problem is that the resistance of the switch depends on the input thereby limiting the maximum amplitude you can put in because the distortion second harmonic and the third harmonic you get go on depending on on the input amplitude. And all the three candidates we have have this disease with uh, with varying intensity. Hmm? The uh, transmission gate seems to be the least uh, affected of the three. But the basic problem was that the resistance of the switch depends on the input. If we somehow made the resistance of the switch independent of the input, then you would be able to avoid distortion altogether. So, the problem is resistance of the switch depends on input. So, if we somehow made the resistance of the switch independent of the input, then you know it looks like a linear resistor and you are all set. Now, and why and let us take this particular candidate. So, if this is V in, why is the resistance of the switch depending on V in? When we turn the switch on, we made, we connected the gate to VDD in order to turn it on. The resistance of this device is 1 over mu n c ox w by l times V d d minus V n which happens to be V g s of the switch minus V t. For the time being we will neglect the fact that V t is also dependent on the input. So, clearly looking at this expression the problem becomes obvious and the problem is that the V g s of the switch the resistance of the switch is varying because the VGS of the switch is varying and the VGS depends on the input. So, if you want to make the resistance of the switch constant irrespective of Vn, what would you want to do? You make, you want to make VGS constant, okay. You do not want to make VG constant, you want to make. So, if VGS was made constant, made independent of input rather, then distortion would be avoided. Well, what is VGS? VGS is VDD minus Vn and this must be made a constant irrespective of the input. So, let me call this uh, V constant for that matter and what is VDD? VDD is nothing but the gate potential. So, this is the gate potential. The source happens to be at Vn resulting in a VGS of Vg minus a VDD minus Vn. So, you want the gate source voltage to be a constant irrespective of the input which means what must you do to the gate? The gate must be V constant. So, if you somehow make the gate potential not V d d when you want to turn the switch on, but V in plus some constant voltage right then automatically V g s which is V g minus V in becomes a constant which means that the resistance of the switch remains independent of the input. Okay, the idea is very simple and again uh, this, is a, uh, this is a very key idea and almost all converters nowadays use uh, this basic idea. So, so, in other words instead of turning the I mean connecting to the gate to a constant potential during the uh, track phase what you want to do is to connect the gate to a potential which is some constant plus the input so that the input dependence of the switch resistance is so, the, now the question is uh, you know what should I choose? So, we constant. So, what would I want to choose? I mean ideally you, the switch resistance will become as small as possible if if VGS is very very large. So, uh, one good choice seems to be to choose V constant to be equal to VDD. This is not the only choice mind you, but this is a reasonable choice. The obvious question is now if uh, uh, V constant is equal to VDD the gate must be V constant plus V n and clearly will be if V n goes from 0 to V d d then clearly the gate potential is going above the supply voltage. 
so one legitimate question is how are you going to generate i mean typically we are used to the notion that when you have supply rails of zero and vdd no potential no node potential can go above vdd so the question is how will you go and get this potential and we will uh, we will see us in the next uh, 15 minutes or so now let's go to the basic idea uh, now that we understand this uh, how will you turn the switch off simply connect the gate to ground as as usual so to give you a graphical illustration earlier this is before uh, the gate potential was constant the source potential was this is vg this is vdd and the source potential was doing this so this is vs and clearly around this region is terribly problematic because the resistance of the switch becomes very very large and uh, as we saw this leads to a lot of distortion so after what do you think will happen to uh, vg this is vg and this remains so at all points in the signal cycle you can see that vgs is a vgs whether you are here or here the vgs is a constant so conceptually what does one do during the track phase you must you must generate a vg which is v in plus v constant which we chose to be vdd and what is the simplest way of generating vdd v in plus vdd you take the battery you take a battery of pulp vdd and put it in series with vn so this voltage will simply be vn plus vdd so this is what you need during the track phase okay. and we have seen that if you have uh, you know if you have a capacitor which is charged to vdd uh, to a to a certain voltage if no current is being drawn from the capacitor it is indistinguishable from a battery so the basic idea is to say that i will not use a real battery obviously i will take a capacitor charge it to vdd and use that as my battery let me call the sampling phase let me call this as phi 1 and let me call the hold phase as phi 2 for example you might be if this was phi 1 this could be phi 2 this is the sampling period so one clock period please note that phi 1 and phi 2 are non overlapping waveforms simply because you don't want to be sampling and holding at the same time it doesn't make sense so you sample then you hold so what do you do so you have the switch so let's now try and implement this character here you have this is the main master switch whose resistance you are attempting to keep independent of the signal so you have your capacitor which is behaving like the battery so when the, the when the switch is sampling what should you do to the capacitor the, this is being charged to vdd let's assume that this is somehow being charged to vdd so during the sampling phase phi 1 what would you want to do you connect the capacitor between the gate and the source so these are all switches we'll figure out how to realize finally these switches have to also be realized using mass transistors we'll figure that out later but conceptually this is what you want to do during phi 1 you want to connect the capacitor between the source and the gate and then phi 1 goes off so what should you do to the capacitor i mean during phi 2 what do you think must happen to the gate you connect it to ground so you have that what is the capacitor doing in phi 2 is it needed or is it not needed it's not required okay you know that any practical capacitor when you have uh, all these devices have pn junctions the source bulk junction is there and the drain bulk junction is there and all pn junctions have have leakage current so if i just charged uh, you know dumped some charge on this capacitor in the beginning and uh, hope that that charge would remain there forever i'd be sadly mistaken because soon leakage current will go and discharge that capacitor so what should i do i can't just be satisfied with charging the capacitor once and then hoping that everything will be okay i better do it you know periodically i mean with sufficient frequency so as to replenish any loss lost charge and as uh, and uh, a safe way of doing that is to actually replenish the charge every cycle so and you know that during phi 2 the capacitor is not required anyway so what you can do is to connect the capacitor this is phi 2 what should it be connected to the top layer of the capacitor must be connected to this switch must go to vdd 
Okay, and what should the bottom plate uh, be connected to? Ground. And what should this end of the switch be connected to? That goes to the sampling capacitor. And what should the bottom plate of the sampling capacitor be connected to? Should be connected to another switch. And this switch is clocked by phi 1, phi 1. So that's a good point. So if you make the VGS independent of the signal, then VGS minus VT is also independent of the signal. So the, the charge in this transistor becomes independent of the of the input. So uh, the question is, uh, does it now make sense to uh, uh, you know use bottom plate sampling? Yeah. So you know that VT, in spite of all this, the VT here is a function of Vn. It's uh, fairly weak, but it is definitely a function. So it still makes sense to use bottom plate sampling. And please note that we were hoping that this will be Vn plus Vdd. That can only happen under the what circumstances? Please note that we do not have a real battery. We have a fake guy here. You take a capacitor, I mean, please note that any node will have some capacitance, right? So, for example, there will be some capacitance from there to ground, correct? So, when you take this capacitor and put it between the source and gate, what can you expect to happen? If you put two capacitors together, what will happen? There will be some charge transfer from this plate to that plate, the amount of charge depends on this voltage, that voltage, all this. So, for one, you can expect that this voltage will not remain Vn plus Vgs, I mean Vn plus Vdd as we expected. In practice, you can expect that there will be some, uh, you know, uh, some deviation from that, which uh, in principle could, could again also cause this charge to become signal dependent. So, for all these reasons, it is still a safe and nice sound strategy to use the bottom plate sampling technique. And as you know, somebody pointed out, the threshold is also a function of uh, V. So what is the next job we have? Are we done or we need to do something else? What do I need to do? So, uh, very conveniently drawn, all the switches, right, as ideal switches, which are controlled by some waveform. Clearly, I need to implement these switches with real transistors. So, I have to replace every switch I see in this schematic with real transistors. So, let us start one by one. Let us say this guy. So, what about this guy? NMOS switch. Okay. So, the suggestion is why do not I use an NMOS transistor? This gate must be controlled by phi 2. And why does this make sense? The phi 2 goes from 0 to VDD. So, clearly when uh, uh, this gate voltage is VDD, the gate source voltage is uh, VDD uh, you know minus 0 which is VDD. So, there is a lot of overdrive and you basically have a switch which turns on without any problem. Now, the next chap to handle is this fellow. See, what all switches do you know so far? Candidates, what are the four candidates you want to work for? One guy is if you want to turn on a switch, you can do it with an NMOS transistor whose gate is controlled by the by the waveform when you want to turn the switch on. An alternate thing is a PMOS transistor whose gate is controlled by phi bar. A third candidate is a transmission gate which is a combo of NMOS and PMOS connected together. So, when do you think using under what situations do you think using this kind of switch makes sense? When these two terminal voltages that is this guy and this guy. When these two terminal voltages are very very low compared to VDD, it makes sense to use a NMOS switch because that is when you get the largest overdrive for the NMOS transistor. When these two voltages start to go up, the NMOS transistor becomes a poorer and poorer proposition simply because the gate overdrive of the switches is progressively getting reduced. And if these two inputs actually go to VDD minus VT, an NMOS switch will not do the job at all simply because there is no overdrive in the for the transistor. Is that clear? To turn an NMOS transistor on, the VGS must be greater than V. So obviously, uh, when these two terminals start, uh, you know, moving up, that becomes a problem. So by analogy, when is the PMOS transistor a good candidate? When the when these two voltages are very high. 
the two voltages you want to equalize are very high, then it makes sense to use a PMOS switch and none for I mean and it has to be controlled by phi bar. Basically, you want to close the switch when phi is high. So the gate of the PMOS transistor must be grounded when you want the switch to turn on. So in many situations you have inputs which go, these two waveforms will take on a wide range. Okay. One example is this situation here, right? V in can go all the way from 0 hopefully to V D D, okay, because you want to maximize the signal swing. So if this is the situation, can you comment on what kind of switch I must use here? I must use a transmission gate because if I simply used an NMOS switch, it won't work because when the input goes high, I am killed. When I do, I, I won't be able to use a purely PMOS switch simply because when the input went low, I would get killed. So the thing to do is to use a transmission gate, hopefully it won't kill me in both situations. So this is phi 1, this is phi 1 bar. 